morning, we are blessed indeed. And I'm not going to take a lot of time to introduce him, although I think so highly of this, this, this man and the gift that he is. He's ministered here before. Yeah. And so we are looking forward to receiving the word of the Lord through Dustin Martin. So from yeah. Fort Worth, Texas, would you welcome Dustin to the podcast awesome. this morning? Praise the, Lord. Thank you, Pastor. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Man, welcome everybody. Revival time. We're back. How many of y'all are excited about that? My heart is full with uh, what I know God wants to do in these meetings. And so I'm just excited that you're here um, and uh, that we have the opportunity to spend time placing our eyes on Jesus. Uh, the Bible talks about, in, uh, it talks about uh, looking away from all that distracts unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And so I just have high expectations for what God's going to do, and I want to encourage you to do the same. Uh, uh, in uh, Acts chapter 3, it talks about the man that was laying at the gate called Beautiful, and it says that he uh, gave Peter and John his attention, expecting to receive. And expectation is the ground for miracles. And man, my heart is stirred. I believe that God's going to do some things that will bring change, that will bring some uh, excitement, that will bring some things that will forever shift our thinking and our perspective uh, on, on, on our lives and what God has for us. Amen. So praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, I want to honor your pastors. How many of y'all love your pastors? Give honor where honor is due. Uh, they have been such an inspiration and a, uh, an encouragement to my life, our ministry, and I just want to honor them and say thank you so much. Uh, you know, during 2020, we all kind of got a little rattled and uh, was like, wow, this is, this is fun. And so, um, you know, as a traveling minister, you, uh, you travel. <laughs> Who knew? And so uh, with churches closing down, there was uh, these three months where we were just like, you know, uh, uh, loving God, thinking of the lost. Amen. And, uh, but your pastors, they reached out to us. They, they encouraged us. They, they showed their support and their love. And so uh, I am just so thankful for your friendship and for that, what you've sown into my life, I count it as an honor and a privilege and, and, uh, and just the relationship that God has, has cultivated. It means a lot to me. So thank you for trusting me and allowing me to be with you all this morning once again. Amen. My wife sends greetings to you from, uh, from Tulsa. I was just in Tulsa. From Fort Worth, Texas. And, uh, and so uh, she greets you. Wishes she could be here with us. But we have uh, two children. Uh, a four-year-old and an almost six-year-old. Come on, somebody. And so, uh, yeah, we're, we're living the dream. So we're having a good time. And so they're home. They're praying for us. They're believing God with us that great things will happen. And so I'm just uh, excited about that. If you have your Bibles this morning, if you'll turn to Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60, I'm going to be sharing some things that God's been speaking to me, some things that he has been cultivating on the inside of me. And as you're turning there, I'm going to uh, lay some thoughts and the reason why this is burning so passionately on the inside of me. So uh, it may take me a minute to get to Isaiah chapter 60, but uh, if you get bored, you can start reading. Amen. All right. So anyways, <laughs> um, as we're turning there, I... Uh, uh, I want to share a couple jokes with you just to have some fun. So there was a pilot and a, a preacher, a pastor, that were standing in line at the gate, the pearly gates. And Peter, of course, is standing there checking people in. And the pilot comes up and, you know, he's cool, got his leather jacket on, his jeans, his aviators. And Peter says, what's your name? He said, well, my name's Pilot Pete. He's looking through the books. Sure enough, there he is. Man, a big grin comes on Peter's face. He says, here's your silk robe and your golden staff. Come on in. Boy, Pete goes walking in. Well, pastor walks up there. He knows if the pilot got rewarded, he's going to have a reward. So he sticks, steps up. Peter says, what's your name? He said, my name is Pastor Bob from such and such a church and such and such community. He went to look. And, well, sure enough, there you are. Gave him a, a, a cotton robe and a wooden staff. Pastor Bob said, wait a second, Pilot Pete got a golden staff and a silk robe. What's going on here? He said, Peter said, well, up here we go by results. When Peter, <laughs> when Pilot Pete flew, people prayed. When you preach, people slept. <laughs> so anyways, <laughs> yeah, anyways, I like that. 
Back in, uh, back in around the time of 2010, 2011, I was on staff at a church, and we were singing that song, Show Me Your Glory. How many of y'all remember that song, Show Me Your Glory? And it began to bring question to my heart because we also said things like, thank you, God, we glorify you. And, and there's these words that were being given that I didn't have understanding about. And so it, it sent me into a, a word study, a time of digging into the word of God to find out about the glory and then in 2011, as, as I was spending time with God and, and, and getting ready to step into what we've been doing now for the last nine years, traveling and ministry, the Lord began to speak to me and he said, Dustin, I'm going to use you to break the mindset of religion in the hearts of men by revealing my glory and my anointing. And it began to, again, there it was, the glory. And I began to, to, begin to allow that, that uh, information and this picture that God was beginning to paint on the inside of me to become alive. And I asked God, I said, God, what is religion? And I've never heard this before, but the Lord spoke to me and he said, religion is wanting results without intimacy. Religion is wanting results without intimacy. And I believe that we're stepping into a time right now that is very crucial and is th that is very strategic. Um, when we entered into 2020, uh, every, every month I write a letter to partners and friends to encourage them and just to uplift, uplift them. And of course, I did some study on on the number 20. We're stepping into 2020, and I wanted to know what that meant. And so some simple things I just want to bring to your attention is simply this, that, um, that 20 in the Bible signifies a perfect waiting period. A perfect waiting period. And that after 20, the reward is generous and full of God's love. That after 20, that time of perfection of waiting, you go through and you see all the different scenarios where there was a 20-year period of waiting or pursuance of something. Uh, there was a generous, a generous outpouring of the fullness of God's love. It's the fullness of time, and this is what I want you to hear. It's a new season. Everybody say new season. New season. It's a new season. What took place in 2020, and we'll probably get into this maybe today or tonight, that 2020 was a... a, a an attack or the devil doing his best to bring about his will in this earth because he knows his time is short. And so he tried to, to get our eyes off of what really mattered, but what was happening was we were stepping into, and this is why the devil attacked so hard, and that what I want to encourage you as the church, we've stepped over the threshold and we've stepped into a new season. We're in a new season where there is some things that are coming to pass, some things that are unfolding, and that we're needing to have our eyes opened to what God is doing. And with that said, I, wanna, I want you to hear these words, that as I was preparing for these services, I heard this, that these meetings will mark the moment where there will be a shift, a change, where the momentum began and increase was incited. I'll say it again. I believe that these meetings will mark the moment. This is, this is not by accident that we are, that God has placed this vision on your pastor's hearts that in this moment where there's a, a, a dispersion, there is a separation, that there is a call, I believe, by the throne room of heaven that is saying, come back. Come back to that place where there is, there is an expectation, there is a, a, a desire for the presence of God. So that these meetings are not just a time for you to say, wow, we had a, another set of revival. We had another year where we did our meetings. I believe it's very strategic. I don't know how else to say that, to, to lay a weight in your hearts about what God is doing. But there is something very important about this time and the season that we're living in. We're living right before the return of Christ. And there is such an importance that we need to uh, uh, be focused and determined. It's time for us to get into position. 
to get into position and begin to uh, uh, begin to operate, mm, begin to operate in the fullness of what God has given to us. And so that's why I believe that these meetings will mark the moment. Everybody say moment. That defining moment where there was a shift and a change where the momentum began and increase was incited. I believe that everything is building towards one event. It is all about the manifestation of the glory of God being revealed in the earth. It is to be seen, it is be, to be recognized and set out on display. Yeah. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 5 declares this, this prophecy, this, this, this word from God that says, the glory of the Lord will be revealed. I love this. And all people, let me, I wrote it here, all people shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. All people will see God's glory. Woo, come on, somebody. All people will see God's glory. When you talk about the glory of God, you're talking about the manifested presence of the Almighty. See, there, there's this understanding that God is omnipresence, that God is everywhere at all times, but God's manifested presence is not always manifested. Because I believe there's an atmosphere that has to be cultivated. There has to be a welcoming heart that set itself into position that says, God, you're welcome here. And I believe, and you can sense it in this church, that there has been a cultivation. There has been a stirring of anticipation that is not just waiting to see what God will do, but says, Father God, your glory, your presence is welcome, not only in the house corporately, but in my personal life. God, I'm welcoming your glory. Because listen to me, God does nothing apart from working and co-laboring with man. God did not come to, to simply show off, and we'll get into maybe this in a minute, but to show off and just let everybody stand back and watch him. God chose from the foundation of the earth that he would create man and co-labor, working through man to establish his will in this earth. When God talks about all people will see his glory, this is not just something that God will do apart from the church. It is something that God is declaring to wake us up as a body and say, I'm ready. There is a new season. This is a new time, and I'm ready for you to arise. We'll get into my text here in a minute. For you to arise and begin to allow that which I desire, which is my presence, my glory, to be manifested and be made uh, 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 revealed in you. Isaiah chapter 51 verse 17 says, awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem. Isaiah 52 verse 1 says, awake, awake, put on your strength. Man, when I read that, something went off when I saw the word your. Your indicates ownership. Something that has been given to you that is rightfully yours. He's saying, put on your strength. And if there is a, a word that I believe that, is, that has been desired, that the church is anticipating, it is this word, awaken. Amen. There is a great awakening. There is a great awakening that the church is desiring. There's this, there's this stirring. I don't know if anybody's felt it, but there's a, there's a stirring. There's a rumbling on the inside of your spirit that is, there's this something that's saying, man, now is the time. This is the season. It is to arise. It is to awake to that position, to put on that clothes, that, that strength, that ability that is in Christ. Amen. This is the great awakening we desire. And sense. It is the beginning of that which will take place. As we take our place, it will be fulfilled. When you read Matthew chapter 1 and verse 22, 
It talks about the Virgin Mary. It talks about Jesus being, being born. And I like what it says in verse 22. It says, all this was done so that it might be fulfilled. All this was done so it might be fulfilled. Ephesians 5, 27 talks about Jesus coming back for a glorious church without spot and without wrinkle. I don't know. I don't know what your theology is or how you think. I believe that the world is getting darker. I believe that the evil plans and ideas of man are becoming worse and being pushed to the forefront. But I do know this, is that God, Jesus, is not coming back for a church that's beat up, tore up, and barely making it, going, Father God, help us do something. I said this, that when we get out of the mentality of looking to be rescued and get the paradigm shift that we've been called by God to be the rescue to a lost and hurting world, we will see the revival that we've come to know, love, and desire. I'm not looking to be rescued. I was rescued 2,000 years ago when Jesus hung on that cross and shed his blood for all my sins and all my wrongdoing. Now what it is is a time for us to awake and begin to allow the glory, the manifested presence of God to rest upon us and to begin to stir us so that we can become the individuals that bring life change to the world in which God has called us to. Did you find Isaiah chapter 60? <laughs> Hallelujah. Still glad you came this morning. I feel like I just, my wife said, honey, go slow. Don't give him the fire hose. I didn't listen very well. I apologize. <laughs> Here we go. After preaching one Sunday, I had a guy come up to me and he said, he named this famous preacher. He said, don't give him a fire hose when all they need is a thimble. I don't know what that meant. I took it as correction. So I don't know. I guess, uh, you know, pump the brakes a little bit. So we'll do time to see what, see what we're supposed to do. I want to read Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 through 5. I'm not going to get into all those verses, but there's so much here that I want us to see. I'm actually going to read, and the media team, I apologize. I didn't give this to you, but Isaiah 60, 1 through, um, 1 through 2 in the Amplified Bible. Listen to these words. It says, arise. Everybody say, Arise. Arise from the depression and prostration in which circumstances have kept you. I mentioned this a minute ago. What we went through in 2020 was nothing more than a, 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 an, an endeavor by the enemy to quiet, silence, and de- belittle the church. Trying to get us out of position. And I love that this word, I believe it's in season. I believe it is a, not just a timely word for, for, for the church, but I believe it is the, the voice that is being declared from heaven because of the season that we are in, that it is a time to arise from the circumstances, the, the depression and the prostration in which circumstances have kept you. And I like this. It says, rise to a new life. Rise to the new life. There's a, there's a, a way of living that God has given to us. Uh, Jesus said in John 10, 10, my purpose, the, the reason that I have come forth, the reason that I am here is that you would have life, Amplified Bible says, in abundance to the full until it overflows. The reason he came was to give you a new life. He didn't take the old life and put, you know, put, put, you know, just kind of put some new mud, new wallpaper and paint and kind of said, that'll do it. He, God came in and completely renovated, tore out the old and put a brand new nature on the inside of you. That, that's that, that spirit of life that is in Christ Jesus lives on the inside of me, which enables me now to be a carrier of the presence of God. Before, I was not able to carry it. Why? Because of the sin nature that was in me. But God did not leave me in my my, my state that I was in. He came in and made old old things passed away, all things becoming brand new. 
When you have a revelation of who you are in Christ, it enables you now not to stand back with trepidation or wondering, will God use me? Will God do something through me? But rather now you're coming boldly and confidently into the throne room of heaven where you walk in and you say, oh, but daddy, and he embraces you and he begins to release all that which is in him into you. Why? So that you can bring change to the world that you encounter. So arise to this new life. Shine, be radiant with the glory of the Lord for your light has come. John chapter 1 says Jesus, uh, 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 John chapter 1 talks about that uh, uh, the, the light has come, that Jesus is the light of the world. Your light has come. And the glory of the Lord, this is what I want you to see, has risen upon you. See, when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there is a presence, there is a spirit that comes and takes residence on the inside of you. But then there's an additional experience that comes upon you. It's Acts chapter 10 and verse 38, how God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost and with power. Holy Ghost was for him. Power was for the people. See, God, God's not just interested. A lot of us, are we're, we become satisfied with the fact that I'm going to heaven. But God didn't just say, hey, here's your ticket. Survive until I come. Try to hang out, hide out till I come. God said, Be, take, uh, take dominion and occupy till I come. Do my will and my bidding till I come. And that, that, that ability comes from that, that, that presence that rests upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and dense darkness all people. But the Lord shall arise upon you, O Jerusalem. I don't have time to theologically get into this, but you could say, arise uh, upon you, O church, and this glory shall, shall be seen on you. Go back to Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 5. All people will see his his glory. How are they going to see the glory? It'll be by this endeavor that the glory of the Lord has been risen upon you and through you and what has been made uh, uh, or what has been welcomed in your life will be, seen, will be seen by the ones you encounter. So when the Bible talks about, well, let me continue reading these verses. Verse chapter three, the Gentiles shall come or the nations shall come to your light, the kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They all come to to you. Your sons shall come from afar. Your daughters shall be nursed at your side. Then you shall see and become radiant. Your heart shall swell with joy because of the abundance of the sea or the nations shall be turned to you. The wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. Church, listen to me. The more that we become aware of that presence that rests upon us and become uh, 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 comfortable with being a carrier, a host of God's presence, the more uh, valuable and more... um, What's the word? Uh, uh, Good looking. What's that word? Uh, uh, Attractive. Thank you. The more attractive that we'll become to the world. We think that we've got to come up with something that will entice them to come. And if we'll just read these verses and just see what God is saying, all we have to do is begin to be a, a carrier of the presence of God. Allow the presence, the goodness of God, the power of God to rest upon us. And by doing this, it'll cause the ones that are in darkness to see the light that is set upon the hill. And all of a sudden, they'll be knocking on the door. Why? Because the, the darkness, the deception, the things that the devil is trying to bring. Say it, don't spray it. Uh, That the devil is trying to bring upon this earth will grip the hearts of men and then they'll see this great light. They'll see this, this thing that will draw them out of the darkness. It'll be the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. When you read there in Exodus 33 where Moses said, God, show me your glory. He said, no one can see my face and live, but I'll make all my... My goodness passed before you. 
One of the things that you're going to be that you're going to see in these end times that is going to cause people to come into the kingdom is the simplicity of the goodness of God. Because they're going to see that the, the, the chaos, the confusion, that which is in, that is engulfing and gripping our, our world, our nations, our cities, our, our communities. There is this hopelessness that is being removed from the hearts of men. And yet there will be a church. There will be those ones that are standing there that will have this expectation and the goodness of God that says, you didn't do anything, you didn't work for it. It was just God's kindness, his loving compassion that brought deliverance to your house, healing to your body, and an abundant supply to every area of your life. And they'll be like, how is this possible? And the only response will be because of the goodness of God. And it will cause them to come out of darkness and it will cause them to run to this, this light that is being radiated off of the church that has welcomed and accepted the glory of God into their lives. So we look at the word arise. Arise, church, to the position of glory. Arise to the position of presence. This idea when you read the word arise here in Isaiah chapter 60 in verse 1 has this, this imagery of posture and position. There is this stand, this, this firm persuasion, this belief system that is confidently standing. You were once sitting, and now there is this, this, uh, uh, this encouragement by the Spirit of God that's saying, get up from your seated position, or that, as it said there, that, that place where circumstances have held you captive, and begin to arise. Begin to take a posture of persuasion and belief. It is amazing to me how many people I believe are pushing back from their beliefs because of new doctrine or new popularity concerning certain things. And I want to say this to you. God spent the last three and even four generations placing on the inside of you that things that you are in need of through the teaching, the healing revivals, the charismatic renewal, these movements in the church, they were all strategically uh, uh, moved by God to bring us to this place. Not so that we could push back and go, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Does God really heal everybody? I don't know. I mean... It's not a time to abandon our belief system. The old adage, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything, is true. When Adam in the garden did not stand up for what he knew was his right and his authority as the God of that garden to take dominance and dominion, he fell from his place of glory into a, a, a sub, subservient position until Jesus came. If you don't stand for something, if you don't arise and not be intimidated by the political uh, agenda or personal opinion of the people you come and you believe that? Absolutely, I believe that. Why? Because I've arised. I I'm standing. I'm taking my position of persuasion, my belief system. It's John chapter 15 and verse 7. Jesus says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. This word arise indicates that, that idea of abiding. I've taken up residence. I live here. This is my home. I, I live here. You're not gonna come in and say, you don't live here anymore. You just got evicted. No, sir, there will be a fight. There will be a, there will be a resistance. Why? Because this is my home. The devil's trying to bring a, a pushing out, an eviction that is not right. And, and as the body of Christ, God is declaring to us to arise, to take that stand of position, that belief that says, I will not get out. I believe this. It's a position of presence. I want you to hear that. This is the season that we're living in right now is a, is a time of presence. To take these moments where we turn our affections, our eyes onto who he is and begin to just magnify him and allow all that he is to consume us. I'll get into some things tonight, but I'm telling you, church, 
the only way that we're going to have the ability to impact the world in which we live is first to come into the presence of God and allow that which is resting upon us to impact me first. I can't impact you until I've been impacted. I can't make change in my world until God has brought change on the inside of me. Yes. Yes. Man was never intended, I want you to hear this, man was never intended to be without the glory. Psalms chapter 8 and verse 4 and 5, it talks about what is man that you are mindful of him the son of man that you visit him. And then it talks about there in verse five that you've crowned him with glory and honor. Not just things sitting on your head. God has crowned you. He's engulfed you. He's, he's placed upon you the very presence of the almighty. And this, this creation that God did and he took his glory his presence and he placed it upon man it caused all of creation to stand back at all they they could not comprehend they could not understand what did God just do that he actually placed his essence his his person on this individual he crowned them with a glory with a presence and it didn't incinerate them it it rejuvenated them a presence, and then he said honor, which is fixed value. There's value that we have with stock markets and your car and all those, they go up and down in value. Come on, somebody. You know, the, 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 the wisdom is don't buy a new car because the moment you drive it off the lot, you lost three grand. Go buy a used car with 12,000 miles on it, you'll save yourself $5,000, right? There's wisdom. Your value from the day that God created you and breathed the breath of life into you does not fluctuate with you. It has been set in, in a permanent position in Christ. He crowned you with his presence, his glory, and he placed a fixed value on you that caused all of creation to stand back and say, what is man that you, that you, that you visit him, that you're mindful of him? Romans chapter three, we've stated this in verse 23. It says, and all have fallen short of the glory of God. We fell from our position of presence. Adam lived, that's why he, he, lived, in the, in, 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 he lived in the glory. He was clothed with glory. And the moment he fell, what was the first thing that he did? He fell from glory and he hid himself. It's amazing that as you allow the enemy to lie to you about who you are and that thing you said and that thing you did, how much it causes you to push back from God, to step back because you feel as if that if I stand in his presence, there will be judgment, there'll be criticism, and there'll be things that he'll dislike about me. And yet when we get a revelation of how much God loves us and what he did for us in Christ Jesus, there's a different perspective. I'm not trying to hide myself. Now I'm trying to run into his presence. Why? Because it's in his presence where there's fullness of joy. There's strength. There's the adequate supply that is needed for the life that he's called me to live. God didn't leave us in our fallen state. We fell from that position of presence. Through the shed blood of Jesus, we are reinstated to glory. Every taste, listen to this, every taste of his presence is an invitation for more. Whew. Every invitation, or every taste, I mean, of his presence is an invitation for more. Let me read this out of, out of the Message Bible. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to start in verse 16 here because of the message. It does it that way. Whenever, though they turn to face God, as Moses did, God removes the veil, and there they are. I love this. Face to face. 
In Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, the word presence is also indicated by countenance or face. When you talk about the faith, you talk about the presence of God, you're talking about God looking you in the eye, face to face. You know why God hates lying? We'll use that. Why God hates lying so much? Because it pulls your eyes away from his. My little boy Ezra, he'll be six August 30th. You can tell when Ezra's lying. Because when he tells the truth, especially when it's about his little sister, Brooklyn. He'll look you in the eye. Daddy, I wouldn't lie to you. Dad, look at me. I'm telling you the truth. She did that. Where's his eyes? He's right here. When it comes to the lie, I'll say, Ezra, you tell me the truth. And it's funny. He gives himself away. He'll start trying to hide the, the grin. You know, he's trying to smile because he knows he's busted, you know. He, he's trying to pull the wool over your eyes. I'm like, come on, dude. I was born at night, but not last night. You know what I'm saying? And he's like, you know, smiling. And where's his eyes? They're, all, they're everywhere, but looking in the face. Why? There's something that happens when you look into someone's face. The reveal, that Bible talks about the eyes or the windows of the soul. There's something that is revealed when you look somebody in the face. And God is no different. He longs for his children to have eye-to-eye contact to be in his face. And when they turn to God as Moses did, he removes the veil. There they are face to face. They suddenly recognize that God is living a personal presence, not a piece of chiseled stone. And when God is personally present, a living spirit, that old constricting legalism is recognized as obsolete. Jesus said, I didn't come to do away with the law. I came to fulfill it. We're free of it, all of us. Nothing between, this is it, nothing between us and God. Our faces shining with the brightness of his face. And so we are transfigured. The same word that was used when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration. He came into that presence. The glory came in and his face, his, his hair, everything began to radiate the glory of God. And so we are transfigured much like the Messiah. Our lives gradually becoming brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become like him. Having a desire for the presence of God, having that, that welcoming mentality, understanding the season that I'm living in is not to live apart from God, but get to that place where I begin to welcome him, become aware of him, taking the time, and I'm gonna show you this tonight that'll kinda, kinda help you tie this in a little bit, but that, get to that place where there's an awareness that the, the presence, the glory of God is resting upon me. This is where you get this boldness to say, when I walk into the room, the atmosphere changes. Not because of who I am, Lord help us, come on somebody. But because of that which I've cultivated and become aware of, that there is, a, there is the living presence of Almighty that is resting upon me because of my sonship, my righteousness, because of the favor and the grace of God, it rests upon me. And then when I walk into the room, there is something that is inside of me that is unsettled about anything that does not line up with the will of God. Because when I walk into the room, I take that moment to align myself with him and say, God, what is your will? What is your plan? What is your heart's desire? And all of a sudden, he'll lead you into a situation. He'll take you to a place where there's something that is not right, where there's oppression of the enemy. And God will begin to say, this is your moment. Lay hands on the sick. They'll arise. Speak a word of deliverance, and there will be freedom. Why? Because of that which rests upon you. I'll end with this. I got to one side of my notes. So we got all this. We'll see what happens. John chapter one, verse 14. Take it, write it down. Because statistically speaking, people that take notes are more likely not to go to hell. Amen. Okay. <laughs> it's not true, but it, it's still good to take notes. Okay. 
But in John chapter 1, verse 14, verse 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Jump down to verse 14, and it talks about how the Word became flesh. And we beheld his glory. We beheld his glory. Let me always forget this part. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Watch this, full. Everybody say full. Full of grace and truth. If Jesus was fully God and fully man, but the Bible talks about in the Philippians that he set his God, his Godness aside and became man. He became flesh. What I want you to see is simply this, that if Jesus came as God and he did what he did that we see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I stand as an observer shocked and amazed, but there's nothing that I can do because he's God and I can only stand there and watch as a spectator as he does what only God can do. But when we see in this scripture that Jesus became flesh and we beheld his glory, he begins to illustrate and demonstrate that as a man clothed with the presence and the power of God, that I too can bring change to my community. And no longer am I observer of what God can do, but now I've been beckoned by God to step into a place of participation and co-laboring with God to do his will so all men can see his glory. It's time for the church not to just stand back and say, God, do something. God's willing to do things for us. God is a loving God. He's there to help us. He's there to support us. But I'm here to encourage you. God's not always wanting to just do things for you. He wants to do something through you. And the, the awakening that I sense in my heart is where we all begin to get excited. And when we walk out the front door, man, we've stirred ourselves up. We've caused an awareness that, that just is, it's tangible upon us. And we walk out and we're just looking for opportunity. We're allowing that glory to radiate that brings the world out of darkness and into the marvelous light. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Father, we magnify you. We thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that you watch over it to perform it. God, I thank you that you've set the course of these meetings. God, that there is a, a, a word, that there is a voice, that there is a, a outflowing of your spirit, that, Father, God will cause there to be an awakening, a stirring, and a new course, a new path, that, Father, God, that will bring fullness to all that you've asked us to do. We thank you. We magnify you for it. I want to give two invitations this morning. Those watching online and those in Platteville, I want you to participate with us. But if you're here this morning and you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, you've never made that decision to say, Jesus, be my Lord and Savior. The Bible says in Romans that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. Man makes it complicated. God makes it so simple. If you have never done that, you don't remember the time, I if you would, just raise your hand. Say, Brother Dustin, that's me. I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. We don't want to embarrass you, but we do want to pray with you. Anybody here to say, that's me. I want Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. Anybody here? Anybody here? It looks like everybody's saved. The second invitation, and what I'll do, is if this is in your heart, you desire this, raise your hand, and then after service, after we've dismissed, if you'll make your way forward, I'd love to pray with you. But the Bible says that, that we are to wait for the promise. Don't go do anything. Don't go, don't go do anything else until you receive the infilling of the Holy Ghost and are endued with power. If you've never received the infilling of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking with other tongues, today is your day. This is the moment that you step into that place of power that brings change to the people you come in contact with. It'll build you up. It strengthens you on the inside. So without further ado, if that's you, maybe you've tried and it didn't work, or maybe you've thought about it, but you've never received Jesus as your, or I'm sorry, we did that one. <laughs> if you've never received the infilling of the Holy Spirit, you say, I want that. Would you raise your hand with me? Again, not to embarrass you, but I want to pray with you. Anybody here? Checking, checking, checking. Everybody. Awesome, awesome. Look up at me, guys. I just want to encourage you. Invite somebody. Yeah. Bring them to the services. Come tonight. I, I was at a camp meeting at Rama in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I saw uh, Miss, uh, Brother Marty Blackwelder. 
Never met him before, but I went to Raymond when he used to lead worship on the stage and have Holy Ghost fits, you know? So I went over to introduce myself, and man, before I could say anything, he jumped up, he grabbed, he said, Dustin Martin, because I'm assuming he saw my name on the, on the advertisement. And so, man, we talked for a minute, and I said, man, I'm going to tee it up. You drive it home. So I'm just telling you, bring some people. You're not going to want to miss these services. We're just going to get them started. He's going to come, and I know God's going to do some great and awesome things. Amen. Love you guys. We'll see you tonight, Pastor. Glory to God.